I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Newsroom. Joining me now is Dr. Marshall Shepard, a climate scientist and Forbes senior contributor. Dr. Shepard, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me back. Of course. So earlier this week, we saw Hurricane Fiona completely batter Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico's governor even called the devastation caused by Fiona catastrophic. What can you tell us about the storm? Well, and yeah, I, my, my, my original hat is meteorologist. I am a climate scientist as well, but my degrees are in meteorology. So I definitely am qualified to talk about hurricanes. And Brittany, this was one that concerned me from the start. I wrote in Forbes uh, before last weekend that there were three things that concerned me. One was that the storm was intensifying. Two, it was a really slow moving storm. And even though it was quote unquote, just a hurricane, category one hurricane, uh, these slow moving smaller storms can be significant rain producers. And that's exactly what we saw in places like Puerto Rico and even some of the other Caribbean islands. Uh, that's a recipe for a flood disaster. When you see a slow moving storm uh, with rain bands like we saw uh, with Hurricane Fiona and the mountains, Brittany, in that region as well, that uplift associated with those mountains on the island of Puerto Rico enhance the rain potential. And then coupled with that, you have landslides, mudslides, and even the winds were strong enough to knock out power. At, at one point, the entire island would, was without power in Puerto Rico. And you said that it was, it was just a category one. So when we're talking about categories of a storm, do you think that lower, does lower category necessarily correlate with less devastation or damage? No, it doesn't. And that's why I use the quotes. I think oftentimes the, the, the public and even some in my field get too hung up on the category. Oh my gosh, it's just a tropical storm. Why are they talking about it? Oh my goodness, it's just a category one. But my own research and, and work that I've done over the years as a scientist has shown that these slow moving weaker storms can often be the biggest rain producers. Of course, category three, category four, category five storms are devastating. Um, they tend to be uh, very wind intensive and so forth. So don't, don't, don't miss what I'm saying if you're listening to this. Category three, four, and five are really big, bad storms that, that cause utter devastation if they make landfall. But we cannot undervalue the impact of, of the so-called weaker storms because those are the ones that often produce the most significant damage. If we think back to Hurricane Harvey in Houston in 2017, Brittany, uh, it, it was a flood disaster for, for Texas. And the vast majority of that 50 plus inches of rain fell while Hurricane Harvey was a tropical storm. You know, and speaking of past storms, Fiona hit Puerto Rico almost five years after to the day that Hurricane Maria swept through the island. It was one of the most destructive storms in U.S. history. So how does Fiona stack up to uh, Hurricane Maria? Very, very different storms because, you know, Maria, one of these big storms with a lot of wind, um, uh, sort of approaching a, ma a major category storm. So uh, more significant wind damage from that storm. As we know, Puerto Rico and our fellow citizens down there in Puerto Rico uh, were without power and resources for weeks and even months in some cases. Uh, as I wrote in the Forbes article last week leading up to Fiona, I, I talked about they aren't the same storm. They will have a different personality, so to speak, uh, but it will be a devastating storm for Puerto Rico, uh, Fiona, for different reasons, mostly because of the flooding. I don't think, but one of the things that, you know, talking about Maria, uh, Brittany, that's relevant to a place like Puerto Rico, they still haven't fully recovered from Maria. Uh, and the infrastructure there, the power grid, some of the transportation network, I saw with Fiona that a bridge was washed out uh, because of Fiona, and it was a temporary bridge that had been erected because of Maria. And so you have this cascade impact where you are still recovering from an infrastructure perspective from a devastating storm like, like Maria, and then you compound it with follow-on storms like Fiona. So that sounds wide scale and devastating. So what, where is Puerto Rico today with um, the recovery efforts from Fiona? I think they're 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 recovering, and I think the the, the federal uh, system and the president and and FEMA and various others acted uh, much more quickly uh, this time around, and so I think that they are on the road to recovery. It'll be challenging, but I think they're on the right path, uh, and I, I think they know what needs to be done. And so, 
you know, I, I've seen, uh, you know, social media posts from friends and colleagues that have family in Puerto Rico, and though, though there are is there, uh, I think it's a much better situation than what we saw in the immediate days after Maria. And is this the last we're seeing of Fiona or is Fiona still a threat? No, I think it's really interesting. You know, as we're, we're as we're talking here on Friday morning, Fiona is a category three, at least the last I checked, storm zooming toward Bermuda. But really what's sort of blowing my mind, Brittany, is that uh, this storm will be significantly strong as it reaches places like Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. I even saw evidence of the hurricane cone near Greenland. These are places that we don't normally mention when we think about or talk about hurricanes. And so uh, I think this will be a storm for the ages uh, as a colleague of mine wrote. And I just published a, a new Forbes piece uh, that I wrote early this morning about the sort of fate of Fiona. And I quoted a colleague who said, kids in Nova Scotia, when they're adults, will be talking about Fiona. That's, that's how bad it could be uh, for, for people in that region. Because one, they just don't get these types of storms. And two, they don't get these types of storms that are going to be this strong that far north. So is this completely unprecedented for these regions? It's not unprecedented, but it's rare. Uh, there have certainly been other storms that have reached uh, this, this region. But this is one of the fewer storms that I've seen that are forecasted to be of this intensity at that latitude. Uh, this could very well, and, we'll, and only time will tell, but this could very well be the strongest storm in Canadian history there. We will definitely keep track of that, but forecasters are tracking several other storm systems as of now. So what can you tell us about those? Well, you know, the, the hurricane season was quiet in the Atlantic for most of August, even though seasonal forecasts projected this to be an above average hurricane season. I think people were starting to question that. But if you look at the tropics now, I don't know, maybe, maybe we will end up being above normal because right now uh, we are tracking Hurricane Fiona, a new tropical depression that is likely to become a hurricane and impact Florida uh, and, uh, and hurricane or tropical storm Gaston, which is far out in the Atlantic and likely won't impact land and two other tropical disturbances that may develop. But the one, Brittany, that I'm keeping my eye closest on uh, is the tropical depression nine, because uh, it may end up in the next few days becoming tropical storm Hermine and eventually hurricane Hermine. And that's headed towards Florida, right? Right now, it's uh, down in the Southern Caribbean. It's starting to develop. And we expect, if, if the models are correct, and I think both of our major models both think this storm will develop, it will develop into a tropical storm and eventually a hurricane south of Cuba. Uh, so people in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands also need to be paying attention to this storm. Uh, as it develops into a hurricane, the models all say that it will, or most of our major models that we look at, suggests that it will cross over Cuba and then impact South Florida or Central Florida. Uh, still a bit far out to determine precisely at this point where in Florida it will make landfall if it does, uh, but it would be sometime in the middle of next week around Wednesday or so. So I think if you're in Florida, really anywhere in Florida right now, you need to be on an alert because the models are slowly starting to come into some agreement that Florida will be impacted next week by this next storm. And I know you said it is far out, but do you think this could potentially be the worst storm for Florida this season? Well, they really had any storms this season. So absolutely. It's been a very quiet season for Florida. It's just been very quiescent there in Florida. In fact, the major city in the United States that has dealt with a tropical storm this year, uh, which is one that people might be surprised at, San Diego. <laughs> they actually were dealing with a, a Hurricane K or the remnants of Hurricane K a few weeks ago. Uh, that's really been some of the only activity in, in, in the last couple of weeks that have affected the United States. So yeah, this is why many of us are sounding the alarm because people in Florida haven't dealt much with tropical storms or hurricanes this season. And so we wanna make sure there's no hurricane amnesia or, or hurricane hangover, if you will, because we hadn't seen anything in a while. Um, now, whether the storm you know, gets to be a category one, category two or category five, that remains to be seen. I do know this, the water temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico are extremely warm, as in as they are in the Caribbean Sea as well. That, Brittany, is the fuel supply for hurricanes, warm, deep ocean water. So um, what concerns me a bit as a meteorologist is that if this storm 
envelope. Uh, it has plenty of high octane fuel, that warm water to tap into. And I know it's been a historically rare start to hurricane season, but it sounds like it's going to be a pretty a active finish. We're in the we're in the we're we're over the hump. I, many of us like to ride roller coasters, and so we get to that first hill, and we're anticipating, and then we peak, and then we come down on that first drop on the roller coaster. Well, the peak of the Atlantic hurricane season is typically around the second week of September, and so. Uh, then after that, we can see hurricane activity all the way through October into November. So even though we have kind of we're kind of in the peak of the season right now, so it's actually not surprising or unusual that we're seeing this time. It just got off to a bit later start than we thought it would. And there's some reasons why uh, related to some broad atmospheric conditions that are a little bit beyond the, the scope of the nation, but we, we think we understand the reasons why the season started off more slowly than anticipated, but it's got time to make up for it. I mean, we've got much of September left as well as October, and right now at the end of September, uh, the basin, the Atlantic Basin is quite active. Well, Dr. Shepard, we will keep an eye on all of this, and thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Brittany, for having me. I'm happy to chat anytime because I, I love geeking out about the weather. And we love having you. Thank you.